Well, normally I would say let's wait a minute for people to be late because after all this is a con. But since there's no structure to this whatsoever, it doesn't really matter. So I'll just go ahead and talk. If you don't know who I am, my name is Mark Whipple. I am Legal Inspire on Twitter for my official legal Twitter account. My website is legalinspiration.com. But my informal account, which I think most furries have seen me on, is Whipple Mark. And you can find that very easily as well. That's where I tell most of the stories that aren't law related and where I don't have to pretend to be an actual professional. Uh, although, since the two Twitter sites are linked, I'm not sure why I bother, but it seemed like a good idea. And that's something that we'll get into about, you know, the professional appearance that lawyers are expected to maintain versus what we actually do, which is quite, at least for me, because I'm old and I don't care anymore. But if, you're well, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, I do repost some really funny stuff, so it's worth it. And occasionally I have something interesting to say as well, so please do. Uh, I'm not very good about keeping up my blog. I apologize for that. <laughs> but you can also check that out as well. And that's, again, at legalinspiration.com. So I have a question, first of all. I think my streak is about to be broken, but I'm going to give it a shot. Is there anyone else in this room who is also an attorney? So, not going to admit it? Nobody? Believe it or not, this is the first time I've ever done one of these panels where there wasn't some another attorney who just happened to be at the con who showed up in the room. And usually what I do is drag them up here and make them participate as well, which is a trick I learned from my good friend, Boozy Badger, uh, who is not here. Um, he has people in his life who, are, who have immune issues, and he himself is you know, his family's main provider of income, so he is not visiting cons right now, which I think is a good decision for him. I wish him and his family the best. They're all lovely people. Uh, but we did a different decision, so we are here, and I'm here to share a few stories with you lovely folks. Like I said, especially since I have the mask, it's fine. Feel free to pretend that I'm him. I understand. He's a funny guy. If you don't know who Boozy Badger is, I don't know why you're in here, but if you don't know who Boozy Badger is, look him up on Twitter as well. It's just like it sounds, Boozy Badger. So, if he happens to watch this later, hi Boozy, please don't sue me for trademark infringement. Thank you. Anyway, legal horror stories. All right, question. If you've ever worked in a customer service or a retail job, raise your hand. All right, good, that's great. Because you know what it's like to deal with customers, right? Now imagine that those customers are worried that if you mess up, it's not that they won't have you know, their cheeseburger with no pickles that they wanted, but they will go to prison. That's what it's like to deal with some clients. Uh, not that they can't be just as vehement about the cheeseburger with pickles. In fact, I think some of them would probably get more worked up because I've met a few who didn't seem to care very much about going to prison, but they probably would have made a fuss about the cheeseburger. Anyway. Not that our job is inherently any more difficult or stressful than anyone else's job, but that we do have unique consequences. You know, obviously with doctors, if they mess up, somebody could die, which is even worse, or even funnier if you have a really bad sense of humor. But you know, I don't do criminal defense. I've only dealt with the criminal justice system a few times. Most of my horror stories involve clients who do things that wouldn't necessarily get them put in prison. It would just get them sued and thrown out of their houses which is obviously much better. You know, nobody, nobody really worries about that. Can we get the door shut? Is that noise distracting people, or does it need to stay open for ventilation? I don't know what the rules are. I haven't done any panels in these rooms yet. I am going to keep wearing my mask because the room is small. I hope everybody can hear me. I have been vaccinated, so if I do project, you know, it's only despair and hopefully not viruses. So I was thinking about what would be a good story to lead off with. And everybody loves a Christmas story, right? Here's a fun Christmas story. I used to be the general counsel of a company that made video games. Well, I've actually done that a couple of times. But this was a small company that made video games uh, for the PlayStation. 
and later for the Xbox, we had Xbox release titles. But because we were a small company and we kind of got put together ad hoc, we had people from all different countries who were in the U.S. on visas, you know, worker visas, which is very common. Um, but if, if you've ever worked with them, you know that they're really persnickety. You have to renew them constantly. They have very strict conditions. And I just I had a standing order as the attorney for the company for all the people who had these visas. You don't leave the country without telling me first. Because you don't leave the country until I check and make sure your visa is current and that if you leave, you can come back in. Now, I thought this was a reasonable policy on the grounds of I wouldn't want to be stranded in another country where I wasn't supposed to be, even if it was my home country, and not be able to go to work. But apparently it was very, very onerous and completely unreasonable for me to say, please don't leave the country until I can make sure that you can come back. Because this happened with depressing things. And the best one was I had one of them who I knew there might be an issue with their visa. This was a long time ago. The statute of limitations was run, and I'm naming no names. Not a problem that couldn't be fixed, but I'm like, something weird going on here. We've got to take care of this. Third week in December, the company I worked for was a very nice company. We got the whole week of Christmas and New Year's off. And I told this person, don't do anything stupid. OK. I'm sure you know I wouldn't be telling this story if he had not done something stupid. <laughs> so I'm at my in-laws having Christmas dinner, feeling fine. And my phone rings. And when you're the general counsel of a corporation, you don't get to turn your phone off. Because uh, that's just the way it works. So I pick up my phone. I see it's a Canadian call. And I'm like, oh no. Because this particular problem child was, in fact, from Canada. I pick it up and I say, hello. First words I hear are, hey, Mark. Merry Christmas! And I'm like, if he called me just to mess with I said, Merry Christmas to you. Uh, how are you? He says, well, I have someone here I need you to talk to. And I said, who's that? And he said, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. <laughs> and I said, are you trying to leave the country? And he said, oh, no, no. I'm trying to get back in. <laughs> and I said, on Christmas? And he said, well, I figured that the crossing wouldn't be that busy on Christmas so that, you know, they would be in a good mood and, and they wouldn't, you know, if there were any, I'm like, this doesn't work very well on the phone, but trust me, this is what I was doing. And I said, okay. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. If you've ever worked in customer service, you've probably had this happen. I went into some kind of a weird fugue state. And I'm not sure to this day, I don't remember what I said to the Border Patrol officer when he put me on the phone with them. All I know is that somehow they allowed him back into the country. <laughs> And I wish I could remember. I don't know if I said some like some magic words and I altered the flow of time. I don't know what happened. I honestly don't remember. But they let him back into the country. And he came back. And everything was fine. So it was a Christmas miracle. I bring that story up so I can tell this one about a different problem child who also happened to be from the great country of Canada. And similar deal, they had, a, they had a visa, and they decided that they needed to go back home. And they were very good at what they did, and we needed them to, to finish the project they were working on. So we said, okay, fine. We're gonna, you know, we will keep you on the payroll as a contractor, we will. We will send you a computer. We will buy you the software. You know, this was back when you actually bought software. And who knows what a dongle is? 
Anybody? Okay, that's pretty good. You don't know a dongle is a little thing that actually plugs into your computer. Some of them now are USB sticks. They used to plug into the joystick port or the printer port or all kinds of things. And it's got a little chip or something in it that tells the computer this computer is allowed to run the software. This very expensive software. If you don't have the dongle, you cannot use the software. It's physically irreplaceable. It's like a game cartridge or a game DVD or CD. So we schlepped all that up to him in Canada. None of the work got done. Nothing. The occasional email of, you know, almost incoherent. My boss was extremely upset. And he said, I want that software back. You know, I, I need that. That's part of the budget. It's very, very, very expensive. And I said, okay, what do you want me to do? He said, well, we'll, we'll have to sue him in Canada. Said, okay. So I made some phone calls. And I got a call. I, I got a lawyer. Filed a lawsuit against him. Because you know, they had signed a contract that they would do the work and that they would give us the software back when they were done. Never showed up. Didn't show up to court. Got a default judgment against him, which is what happens when you don't go to court. Never ignore court papers. Because I could sue you for $20 billion because I didn't like the way you wrote my name on my coffee cup. And if you don't show up for court, the judge is going to say, well, I guess they wouldn't, couldn't be bothered to defend themselves and award me my $20 billion. So never, ever, ever ignore court papers. Good default judgment against them. A lawyer sells it, you know, gives it to a collector. Doesn't show up. Court issues a warrant because he doesn't show up for his hearing. So at this point, because he didn't do the work he was supposed to do, he is now a fugitive from justice in Canada. Which, you know, I assume is like being a fugitive from justice in the U.S., only more polite. <laughs> and, you know, I honestly, at that point, we kind of lost track of the whole situation. The only two things I know are this guy, you know, if he ever shows up at a Canadian court or gets pulled over for traffic violation, they're going to take him to jail because he couldn't bother to answer his emails. And number two, I never got the frickin' software back. <laughs> so anyway, Canadians, not as trustworthy as you have been led to believe. I, was, I say that even though one of them was just a wonderful person and bought my book at the charity auction. He, I think he may actually be an exception as opposed to a rule, you know, as opposed to what you might have thought before. Oh. I had another beautiful one that I just thought of on my way back from lunch. I am an intellectual property lawyer, which means that I don't go to criminal court. I do patents and copyrights and trademarks and things like that. And I do licensing, which is where if you have a patent or a copyright or something, and some other company, you know, say Hasbro or Mattel, because I worked in the toy industry, wants to make it. You know, we've invented the toy. And that was my job for a long time. I worked for a company. All they did was invent toys. They didn't make anything. It's a bunch of smart people, and degrees in industrial design, graphic design, things like that. It was just a co as cool a job as you think it was. You know, it was an amazing job. You know, I told people that I, I basically worked for Santa's Elves. And they would sit around and they'd think up toys, and then they would show the toys to Mattel or Hasbro or whoever. And if they wanted to do it, they would build it, and we would license them the idea, and they would pay us a royalty, just like an author for a book gets a royalty from his publisher. Same, same idea. His or her, or their, sorry. I'm old. Anyway, this is the one that just, to this day, blows my mind. And half the people I tell it to don't believe me, but I assure you that they have. We had a great idea for a toy. We showed it to a company that made that kind of toy. Can't say, can't say what company it was. It was neither Hasbro nor Mattel. It was a large toy company. They loved it. 
they take it into production. And at that time, they still do this, but not as much, but at that time, you introduced all your new toys at Toy Fair, which is in February of each year. It's a big show, it's in New York, it's a trade show. I'm sure you all are familiar with trade shows. You show it in February for the toys that are gonna be for Christmas that year. So the, all the buyers at Toys R Us, which still existed at the time, which is another funny story I'll get to in a second, but you know, would go to these shows, showrooms, look at the toys, decide what they wanted, place orders, because they've got to process it in China, they've got to ship it to the US, be on your shelves, you know, September, October, ready for Christmas. Everybody loved it, buyers loved it. Especially a certain large big box discount store, which shall remain nameless. <laughs> they loved it. This is gonna be huge, this is just what our customers want, it's gonna be fantastic. So we're over the moon, because you know we get these, this information from toy sellers. This certain big box toy seller placed an order for the toys that was in the high seven digits. That's how many units they wanted of these toys, which is an enormous order. I mean, that's, that's practically what this year's Barbie order level is. You know, it's ridiculously amount. So the toy company calls us. So they've ordered you know, seven digits worth of, and we're just, you know, we're like popping champagne, <laughs> we're throwing confetti, we're so happy. And, they said, and we said, that's great. And he said, it would be, except we just canceled the item. And I, and you know, my boss, you know, I'm gonna say I, but I mean we, my boss, said, excuse me? <laughs> Didn't you just say you had this gigantic order and everybody loves it? And they were like, yes, but big box department store that shall remain nameless said they either want the seven digit order or they don't want any. And we said, still waiting to hear what the problem is. <laughs> and they said, here's the problem. If we make seven million of these things, or however many it was, it was in the seven digits, and they don't sell, we have to take the returns and it will bankrupt our company. And we cannot take that risk. And it was either sell them all of them or sell them none of them, so we are selling them none of them. So if you've ever thought about being so successful that you fail, that is the best example I have ever heard. I'm still mad to this day. It's been, good God, it's been 20 years. <laughs> I'm still mad. Uh, it's a very funny story if it didn't happen to you because you just, you're just like, what? <laughs> they just ordered enough to like, that's like the profit margin for your company for three years. Well, yeah, but if nobody buys them, the, and we're back to this. This is all I got. So anyway, that's the kind of thing that happens that you don't think about. You know, you don't, when you think of lawyers, you think of TV lawyers, who are obviously much more attractive than I am, but also you know, do much more exciting criminal things and whatever it is that they do. I tried to watch a show once where there was a patent lawyer, a, a, an actual law show on, pat, on TV, and the woman was a patent lawyer, but she lost her job as a patent lawyer and had to open her own law firm. And in the first episode, she was defending some, doing some kind of criminal defense argument. And I got so upset that I, that I'm kidding you not, I almost shot the television. <laughs> I, I, you know, my wife is around here somewhere and you can ask her. You know, I had to, to leave, because she wanted to see it, the actress who played the, the lawyer was someone she liked, she wanted to see it. I listened to like 30 seconds of her argument, which boiled down to, really, is it so bad? And I was, I, I, I had to leave the room. And whatever it is that you do, I'm sure you've seen it portrayed on the me in the media, on television, whatever, and you've wanted to do the same thing. But this was my shot. This was like the one time a patent lawyer on television, I was so excited, and they turned her into the world's worst criminal defense attorney. And we were right back to this. That's all I did. Anyway, I can think of random anecdotes for an hour, and I certainly will. But I'll let some, if anybody wants to ask me a question, if 
there's some subject of law you have curious of, curiosity about that I have a horror story about. Would anybody like to ask me to tell you a funny story about anything in particular? Right, I'm really grateful for the masks right now because I can't tell if you're asleep. <laughs> Although at least you are holding your heads up and I appreciate that. So let's see, another legal horror story. This isn't a horror story, but this, you know, remember I just said I don't do criminal defense? Have you ever in your job had a customer or a client or somebody that you worked with who just loved you to death and wouldn't talk to anybody else? You know, they'd come in, and sometimes they're creepy stalkers, and that part's bad. But sometimes they're just, you know, I like Mark. I want to talk to Mark. I don't want to talk to anybody else, because that's who I want. And it's very flattering, as long as it doesn't get into creepy stalker levels, right? Because, you know, you, they feel like, you feel very competent, you know, until it gets into the, the income, the scary level. But anyway, I have a client, current client, who well, obviously I can't, talk about a lot. But this client, as is very common, he's, he's a very successful person, he has a business, he's a great person. When he was young, as all of us have done, the only difference is, you know, he did something, not, not something terrible. And this is all a matter of public record, because if you look up my name in cases, you'll find it. So I'm not going to go into details, but it's not a secret. And he had done something silly, and worse, he got caught. Who among us didn't do something silly when we were young? I mean, some of you are young enough to still be doing silly things. But the difference is he got caught. He had this thing on his, on his, on his permanent record, as your teachers and principals threatened you with. And it made him uncomfortable, so he wanted to get rid of it. So he called me, and I am his business attorney. I do contracts for him. I do patents. I do things like that. He's like, can you help me with this? And I, the first words out of my mouth were, I don't do criminal work. And he's like, I don't care. I want you. And I said, I don't do criminal work. And he said, I don't care. I want you to do it. If you want to get somebody else to help you, that's fine. I want you to do it. I'm like, okay. So in Illinois, as in, in many states, I'm licensed to practice in Illinois. There's a process for, for clearing records, and it's really very straightforward because they're trying to give people a break. I mean, for a long time, people, you know, you've heard of ban the box and things like that. You know, they're trying to make it a little easier for people to get their lives back when they do something stupid, as long as they're, you know, trying to do something good. So I go and get the forms, and I'm a patent lawyer. And, you know, unless there are any tax attorneys in the room, which I already said there weren't, are there any accountants in the room? No accountants? Okay, good. Let's screw those guys. <laughs> but other than possibly tax law or securities law, patent law is the most technically complicated field of law. I do homework for a living. You know, I just I fill out bizarre forms all day long. So I get the forms for the criminal defense thing. I'm like, this is like first grade stuff. This is not. I can do this. So I get the forms, and I fill them all out, and I research each and every thing, and I'm you're doing this very carefully. By the time I'm done, I've got a stack of papers this high. I've got all my research, everything. I'm ready. I've got a binder. You know, I'm I am set. File the forms, and what happens is you have a hearing, and the state, the prosecutor's office, can object. You know, maybe they say, well, no, this crime he committed was was so heinous that you know we shouldn't clean up his record. You know, we we should warn everybody about his horribleness. Doesn't happen often, but it can, and maybe they have a point. Sometimes people do kind of bad things, and we don't want to clear their records. I understand. So I go in and I'm telling them we've got to be at the hearing, and of course I'm wearing a suit because I'm a lawyer. And this is how I usually dress when I work. <laughs> Nobody ever sees me. Uh, but uh, so I've got my suit, and I meet him at the courthouse, and he comes in, and he's not wearing a suit, but he's fine. Um, go up there and I've, I've got my papers and I've gone through everything and I like did a little mental Q&A in my head. I'm ready for a walk up to the podium. Judge says, this case, you know, we'll, we'll call him Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, you have this petition. Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. Mark Whipple for the petitioner. 
that's that's how we do it. It's very snappy. You gotta do it. And he's like, okay. Like his, his eyebrows go up a little bit because you know this is criminal court in a small rural county where I happen to live, and nobody is snappy. There are there are lawyers in there who are wearing suits who I swear they inherited them from their grandfather. It's terrifying. But you know, I'm in there and doing my best. Prosecutor comes up. Mr. Prosecutor, yes, such and such for the state. Any objections to the petition? No, Your Honor. All right, order granted. Bang. And I, my jaw just drops. Well, not literally, because that would look silly. But I'm just like, really? I mean, I don't want to fight, but really? <laughs> I have the stack of paper this thick. <laughs> I wrote all this stuff, and I did Q and A with the client, and. Order granted, bang! <laughs> what? And then, so of course, I can't look at my client stunned because I would imply I didn't know what I was doing. So I just kind of looked at him and went like this. <laughs> and we walked out. <laughs> and that was the end of it. Now, if there were any other lawyers in the room, they would all be nodding and chuckling because you know that's half the time. The other half of the time you show up, and the judge wants to talk about something that happened in 1976 that you didn't even know about. And you feel like a fool because you don't know anything. But it's, it's feast or famine in this business. Which reminds me of another story. How many of you have been using Zoom or Teams or Skype or something like that to do work over the course of this, the plague years? A few of you? So you, you know about it, right? How many of you have had a situation where <laughs> Somebody thought they were muted, but they weren't. Somebody thought their camera was off, but it was. <laughs> yes, okay. I'm sure you guys all saw the, the, the lawyer who their kid turned on the cat head filter and they couldn't figure out how to turn it off. <laughs> that was hysterical. Uh, <laughs> I'm not really a cat. Yeah. We know. Cats rarely have managed to finish law school. Uh, I'm not saying you can't have but very rarely. So anyway, I, I, uh, my daughter is disabled. She's autistic. And I did her guardianship. Because I'm a lawyer and I'm cheap. So I, I learned how to do it. It's not my thing. But I learned how to do it. I also did uh, her, Social Security, her SSI, Social Security. I learned how to do that. And now, because I know how horrifying it is to normal people to have to deal with that kind of thing, I do pro bono appearances for guardianships. People, because my daughter's in Special Olympics, so sometimes I'll meet parents that way. Or uh, the people at the county welfare board have some of my cards. They will give them to people and say, this guy might be able to help you. Um, so I do these guardianships. And the guardianship, the way it works is very simple. You file a petition. You say, this person needs guardianship. Now, I only work with people who have children who are about to turn 18 and who are pretty profoundly disabled. I don't do contested stuff like, you know, maybe grandpa lost a step in the grandkids are after their inheritance early. I don't, I don't get into that. I, I do, you know, these people honestly need it, but they're about to turn 18, and technically the minute they turn 18, they're adults, and they can just, you know, they have a tantrum at the mall, and the cop says, you know, you, you don't want to go with them. No, I'm 18, I, I don't have to do what they want. Technically, they're not, they don't have any more authority. Now, any reasonable cop, assuming you can find one, would still not let them just wander off, but, Legally, that's the situation. So anyway, I, I do these guardianships. So people have a, a letter from the court that says this, I'm their guardian. I can say what they do and where they go. And up until recently, we'd go to court and do it. So I'd dress up in a suit. And like I said, it's about the only time I ever go to court is for these things. And then we'd go to court. We'd have a hearing in front of the judge. The judge in my county is always the same judge. And if I do say so, he loves me. Because I always, I always have everything ready. He never has to worry. Because I am completely ridiculous and overprepared. And judges don't like it when you waste their time. I mean, nobody likes it, but judges really don't like it. And judges can put you in jail. So, you know, it's more important that they don't like it. But then we started doing the video hearings. And oh boy. You guys who've been using Zoom, you, you know, you know. 
this is a special, you know, court something or other. But it's, it's like Zoom, only worse. It's supposed to be it's supposed to be really secure. That's why we use it. But it's, it's like Zoom, only worse. The first one we did, it was a mess, but it was an okay mess. Second one, I have a client. Again, this is I'm not going to name names, but this is all on public record. Anybody can go look at it. So it's not really a secret. And I've told the client, okay, we're going to do this from your house. You know, you and, and the, the child have to be there. It's where you end to do it. We do a little prep stuff. I'm like, remember, this is just like being in court, except we're in your house. Okay, okay, I got it. Go to startup. They can't, you know, first problem, they can't make it work. They had done the test the day before and it worked fine. But they can't make it work now. And getting a hearing for these is really hard. And the judge is super nice and he loves me. He's like, tell you what, we can switch to Zoom. You know, I will, I will give you a, a, a variance. We'll switch to Zoom. Come back in an hour and we'll get it work. Thank you so much. To do that, come back. They get Zoom working. Remember, I haven't seen her yet because her thing isn't working. So we come back in an hour. We get her set up. The video comes up. Lovely. They've got a great webcam, high definition. She's wearing a Cubs t-shirt or a White Sox t-shirt. No, it's a Cubs t-shirt. I'm sorry. It's a Cubs t-shirt that says, we don't suck. This is her idea of appropriate court of her. Now her daughter, who remember has just turned 18, is wearing a perfectly nice outfit. She looks great. Mom is wearing enough makeup for Saturday night. By the way, it's Tuesday morning. And a Cubs shirt that says, we don't suck. And then here comes the per it's complicated. The per There's a man who lives in the house. He's, he's involved in this. He comes in. He's wearing a bear sweatshirt and a, you know, I don't know if you call it a beanie or a stocking hat. I don't know where you're from, but, you know, a knit cap with a brim. It's a bear's hat. And this is his idea of appropriate <laughs> court parents. Okay, because it's like 30 seconds till the judge comes out at this point. I'm, I'm screwed. I can't tell them, <laughs> go change your clothes. Uh, I don't want to lose my hearing slot. And I don't know that it won't be worse when they come back. The judge comes up, and, and bless him, he, he's a probate judge. which The probate court is the court that hears wills and estates and guardianships. It's the court that hears cases for people who can't represent themselves. A lot of people are like, why does the same judge hear wills and guardianships? Well, people who have passed away can't represent themselves, so the court represents their interests. People who are disabled can't represent themselves, so the court represents their interests. That's, it's all very similar principles. So he gets up and we start talking, and I had drilled them as I always do, never interrupt the judge. No one likes to be interrupted but judges can put you in jail. So you don't interrupt judges. The judge gets interrupted, oh, maybe six times <laughs> before we've gotten to the formal questions. And the guy in the beanie literally will not shut up. Won't be quiet. Again, all a matter of public record. Normally I wouldn't tell tales out of school, but this was a hearing that you could have sat in on yourselves or watched on video. And the judge, who is one of the most patient people I have ever met, and certainly one of the most patient judges I've ever encountered, eventually says to the guy, sir, get up, leave the room, and don't come back. And his eyes get real big. The, the guy, nobody, nobody talks to me like that. But, you know, thank God for small mercies. He wordlessly gets up and walks out of the room. Because I'm like, please don't go off. Please don't go off. He did. We got it all done. And at the end of it, it is a you know a little bit of a happy ending to the horror story. I sent the judge an email. You know, obviously I can't say, please excuse my client, she's an idiot. Uh, that's that's not zealous represent that's not zealous advocacy. But I did say, I'm very sorry for the informalities in the hearing. 
And I got back a very nice email from him saying, I know it wasn't your fault. And it really made my day. <laughs> because I was convinced, like, you know, I, I had a little capital that I had earned, because I always show up, I'm always prepared. I, I don't know how much of it I burned. <laughs> I definitely burned a little. But it was nice that that happened. Oh, let's see. How are we doing on time? 205. Oh, you guys are stuck here for another 20 minutes. I guess you could run, but then you'd be admitting your cowardice if you left at this point. Let's see. Let's see. I need a funny patent story. How about a funny patent story? Here's a good one. Who here is a computer programmer or knows anything about computer programming? Anybody? No? Okay. There is a technique in computer programming called garbage collection. And it's just what it sounds like. Uh, the programs, as you know, use memory. You know, your, your phone, your computer, whatever. The program needs a certain amount of memory to run. Back in the day, it was a big deal. Now, not so much, because computers have ridiculous amounts of memory. But once the program uses the memory, it's kind of set aside. And you occasionally have to tell the computer to go through and find all the memory that is no longer being used and free it up again so that it can be used for other things. So though it will be set aside and the computer will run out of memory. That's called garbage collection. You just you're looking, you look for garbage memory and you take it out. I don't make these things up. Computer programs. What are you going to do? Anyway, this technique is old. It's been known in computer science since like the 1970s at least. Maybe before. But at one point I had a client who made electronic games, and somebody somehow, I can only assume the patent examiner was on drugs, got a patent for this computer garbage collection technique in a video game. So not for just any kind of regular programs. We already know about that. They'd be like, no, you can do that with video games, and I get a patent. Now, it's funnier because there's no, it's, it's funnier if there are computer programmers because they will start either laughing or sobbing in the audience. But my client gets an email from this person saying, does your game use this technique? Because if so, and I'm just like, wow. I don't know how to say So eventually, I sent this person an email and said, here is a computer textbook from 1973 <laughs> showing this technique. And in the next chapter, here is a chapter about how to program video games. Now, admittedly, like the, the game was like how to program you know, tic-tac-toe on an IBM mainframe. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a video game. <laughs> technically, it's a video game. I'm like, now technically, it doesn't collect the garbage from the tic-tac-toe game because it's a tic-tac-toe game. And it doesn't you, but they're right next to each other in the box. So either stop hassling me, or I will go to the patent office and have your entire patent invalidated, and then you won't be able to hassle anyone. And I never heard anything from them again. <laughs> I didn't even get a response. They're like, well, rats, that's one sucker we'll have to check off the list. And that's something that comes up a lot. That's how patent defense works. You know, if somebody comes to you and they claim you've infringed a patent, then you have to either find out or find a reason why the patent itself is no good, or find a reason why it doesn't apply to whatever it is you want to do. Sometimes you do both, sometimes you do one or the other. I have seen this happen with games, like games of, you know, like board games. I've seen it happen with electronics. And I don't know, I honestly don't know how anybody gets anything done who tries to manufacture stuff because of the stupid patents <laughs> that get issued. Of course, all of mine are innovative and groundbreaking, <laughs> including the one with the puzzle with fuzz on it. That was sheer genius. That was my first patent. 
And that's not really a horror story, but it's a funny story. Um, I'm sure you all know about bar associations. Lawyers have bar associations, professional groups. Well, they have ones for d different disciplines. And when I was right out of law school, maybe a year, I joined the one for patent law in Chicago. And I had just been working for a year for this toy company, and I literally, the week before their big annual meeting, I get my first issued patent. And it is for a puzzle with buzz on it. That was the patent. Who knows what flocking is on a toy or an item? You know, the, the flocking stuff? It's a puzzle, but you flock parts of it so that it has texture. That was a patent. That was the whole thing. And I got the patent. I was very happy. It's my first issued patent. So I go to this meeting, there's all these lawyers, like one of the Supreme Court justices is the guest speaker. You know, these are big, important people, and I'm a year out of law school <laughs> working for a toy company. I'm nobody. And we're talking, and, and I, I foolishly said, oh, I had my first issue this week. And he was like, oh, congratulations. What was it? And I was like this. The puzzle was puzzling. I couldn't meet anybody's eyes. It's just like it wasn't a cool computer thing or a, you know, an engine or a motor or something awesome. Puzzle, puzzle. And you will never guess, unless you've heard me tell the story before, the response that I got. The response that I got from every single patent attorney who heard me say it was, "You must be good." because I would not have even tried <laughs> to file that patent application. <laughs> and I was like, wow, okay, maybe I'm not hopeless. And here I am 25 years later. <laughs> I don't know if I'm hopeless or not, but I'm still doing it. <laughs> so you never know. The easy things can be hard and the hard things can be easy. So, let's see here, we have about 15 minutes left. I will pause again, mostly because I'm thirsty. But does anybody, at this point, have I inspired anybody to ask anything, or thought of anything, or wondered about anything? Sir? Sir? Doesn't um, exactly pertain to you personally, but have you ever... Even better. Like, either through browsing news articles online or papers, seen where somebody files a claim against a copyright and just go, wow, these people are freaking idiots. Every damn day. <laughs> Every day. Although I will tell you a funny story about that. Again, not quite a horror story, at least for me. You can register trademarks with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and I do it all the time. Patent lawyers, patent lawyers and trademark attorneys have this weird rivalry in that patent lawyers also do trademarks, but lawyers who aren't patent lawyers who do trademarks pretty much always hate us because we draft trademark applications like they were patent lawyers, <laughs> and they were really hard to read, and they don't make any sense. And when I say we, I don't mean me, because I have learned my lesson. But you, you could... There are trademark attorneys who can read an application and just tell you from reading one sentence, the person who filed this is a patent attorney. <laughs> and I will see these claims for these trademark applications, and I'll be like, please don't be a patent attorney, please don't be a, and I'll look, and I'm like, damn it, patent attorney. Anyway, you can file trademarks for your, your business, for your you know, the name of your business, what you do, stuff like that. There is a Bar Association for Lawyers Who Do Video Game Law. It is part of the Game Developers Conference. It's a special interest group that's called Game Developers Conference Law. And every year the Game Developers Conference has a big um, conference in San Francisco where people who make games and program games and do content, stuff like that, all get together. And again, it's just as cool as it sounds, at least part of it, because there's a big floor where everybody has all their prototypes and all their beta versions, and you can see all the video games that are going to come out, going to come out soon, as really neat. And the people who do video game law, there's like 20 of us, and we all know each other. You know, and it's actually a pretty good thing, because we don't screw each other over, because we know next time it will be our turn. 
So we actually, we actually work together pretty well for the most part. But there are two particular video game lawyers who I will not name who have some kind of a beef that I don't know about. I don't know the details. But they can't stand each other. And it's really funny to watch. They, like dance around each other when they're <laughs> But at one point, one of them, and again, this is all a matter of public record. I'm not telling tales out of school here. One of them who has been online for many, many years and his tagline for his, he has a blog and a Twitch channel and all kinds of stuff, is the, the video game attorney. You know, I am blah blah, the video game attorney. That's like his little thing. That's what he calls himself. And this other guy, the guy that he has the beef with, goes and files a trademark application for the phrase video game attorney. Which is like the rudest thing <laughs> you can possibly imagine to do. You know, you're all normal people, so you don't understand how horrible this is. So this was like two months before Game Developers Conference. I go to the Game Developers Conference, and there is the guy who, who normally refers to himself as the video game attorney. Who, who he and I, I know him a little bit. He's a nice guy. I've been on panels. I don't know this other guy at all. I've never even met him. So I don't know, you know, I don't know who's in the wrong, who's in the right. I'm not picking sides. So I'm sitting down. We're having this meeting. And we start talking about all the stupid trademark registrations that have come up. Because video game people love to file stupid trademark registrations and then hassle them. Which is common in all trademark law, but for some reason video game people do it. Not the ones with lawyers. You come to me and say, I want to file a trademark registration and hassle, I will tell you no. I will tell you it's a waste of your money. I mean, I like money, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to take your money for something that's not going to work. So people will go out and fill out the form themselves. Because anybody can fill it out. You don't have to be a lawyer. The way I like to say it is it's really easy to fill out. And it's even easier to fill out wrong. Because you will fill it out wrong. <laughs> I promise you. It looks simple. It's not. Anyway, so we're talking about this. And this other guy, who I remember, I've never met him, I don't know what he looks like. I found out later it's him, is sitting behind the guy, the first guy. And he says, if you can believe it, some schmuck filed for the video game attorney. <laughs> and it goes to all the people in the room who know who this guy is, is like, ooh. <laughs> and everybody else is like, what? <laughs> so, if you've ever thought that law was a dignified profession, you know, collegial and, and, and tranquil, you're wrong. You know, Boozy Badger here to be a bad dude. Yeah, Boozy, Boozy would be doing that a hundred times better than me, because Boozy is in court all the time with other lawyers who are idiots. Uh, I mostly work from an office in my house. I do have a little office. I go to it twice a week to collect the mail. That's the reason I ever go there. Um, but, I was just, when I figured, finally found out about this, I was like, that's a lot of money to spend just to aggravate somebody. <laughs> you know, I never had so much money that I felt like filing trademark registrations just to mess with somebody I didn't like. But I guess people do. And from their point of view, it is kind of a legal horror story, because now they've got to deal with it. The ending of the story is that about six of the rest of us and I quietly told the second guy if you actually try to enforce that trademark it will not go well for you nobody no, there were no threats obviously we don't do that when anybody's looking but you know, it was like don't do that it got worked out it's fine but it's just that would be the weirdest thing. <laughs> He's sitting there and have, he's had this presence for years. Everybody calls him that. And all of a sudden he gets a trademark registration. Trademark. <laughs> and I, I, you know, it, I can't even imagine how I would respond to that. So let's see. Let's see. I got 10 minutes left. I got to come up with a really good one. A really, really good one. Toys, video games, gambling, 
Oh, again, not exactly a horror story for me, and, and I will preface this by saying it was a very sad story for someone else. I'm not going to get into the details, but one of those stories that law school doesn't really prepare you for. And remember I said, for most of my career, I was a corporate attorney. I was a general counsel of a couple of different corporations. Now I'm, I work with a law firm. Uh, I don't do criminal defense. But you'd be surprised if you work in a big company how often you will get calls from law enforcement people wanting some kind of information. And I am a, you know, a stickler for the rules. And are, are there any law enforcement people in the room? Anybody who's a police person or anything like that? Because I do not mean to offend you. There are many fine law enforcement professionals in our country. But I'll be honest. I usually don't care for cops. Just how I'm, I'm a rebel. Which, of course, is why I went to law school and became a corporate attorney. I'm, I'm just, I'm punk rock, you know, obviously. Anyway, so I uh, try to behave myself with them, and I'm, I'm never rude. Never be rude to police, ever. Uh, because they can also put you in jail. But I get calls, I'd work it out what they want. But at one point, I get a call from a, a, a Texas Ranger and say, we need to know about such and such with this particular person in your database of game player. And I said, why is that? And they said, because he is currently sitting in the Dallas County Jail on charges of first degree murder. But he claims he was playing a video game of your client's manufacturer at the time of the murder. And I said, well, all right then. This is, uh, up until now, all I've ever gotten is divorce attorneys wanting to know how much they've made playing the game. This is the new one. So I went and looked it up. And I got the information for him. And I, you know, I'm not going to say what happened. I can't. But I, I literally, you know, whether or not somebody was playing a video game at a certain date, on a certain date, at a certain time, might have been the crucial evidence that exonerated them of first degree murder. And that is not something they prepare you for in law school. And it is not something that they prepare you for <laughs> when you do corporate law. But it happens. And that is one of the things that I tell people who are thinking about going to law school, is you may think you're going to be a corporate attorney. You may think you're going to be a this attorney or a that attorney. But there is a reason that law school is comprehensive. And that is because the law, like the world, is a seamless web. And you never know what is going to happen. I have been on the phone at 8 o'clock at night on a Friday night with the president of my company, an external counsel, and a special agent from the FBI trying to decide whether or not we should get an arrest warrant issued for someone we believe to have possibly performed some industrial espionage. Again, not something they prepare you for. You, know, you think, I'm just going to write contracts. I'm going to be a corporate lawyer. Maybe I'll have to worry about HR a little bit. They don't tell you. You're going to get calls from the Canadian border on Christmas Day. <laughs> You're going to be on the phone with FBI agents, you know, trying to figure out whether to have somebody arrested before they can flee. You know, trying to figure out whether somebody is actually doing drugs in the employee lounge. <laughs> you don't know about it. And that is literally all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> but it's really an interesting job. I have enjoyed it very much. And people make mistakes. I understand that. People making mistakes is part of how I earn my living. And so I'm kind of glad sometimes that people make mistakes. I just wish that they would make different mistakes. I wish that they would come to me and say, I want you to, to do all this work, and me to say, you don't need me to do all this work. Because again, I like money, but I have plenty to do. I won't spend your money without a reason. And for me to tell them, oh no, it's fine, go ahead. 
That is far too rarely the case. And who here has heard the expression, it is easier to get forgiveness than to seek permission? That is the practice of law in a nutshell. I have literally had employees say to my face when I asked them, why didn't you ask me before you did this? The answer, because I knew you would say no. How do you respond to that? <laughs> I honestly don't know how to process that. It's, if I was going to say no, it was because my, it's my job to say no. <laughs> So you almost didn't have to ask me at that point if you knew I would say no. Not only should you not, not only should you have asked me, you shouldn't have even done it because you didn't need to ask me. And yet, somehow, and if anybody can explain this to me, please see me after. They went through the process of, if I don't tell them, then I can just do it, and we'll fix it. And that's one of the dangers, that, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this, one of the dangers of being too good at your job is that people will just figure, oh, he'll fix it later. Well, I'm, I'm proud to say that often I can fix it later. <laughs> but sometimes I can. And that's where the horror stories come from. That's where I get the letter saying you are infringing on this trademark and we want the gross profits from every single item that you have sold. You know, you are infringing on this patent and we want the gross profits from every item that you have sold. <coughs> I am stuck in Canada. <laughs> I can't get across the border. You know, I am about to be thrown in jail because I won't stop cursing at the judge. And if there's any lesson to be learned from this, other than I really can talk for an hour about absolutely nothing, it is that when you have important decisions in your life, it's not weak, it's not foolish, it's not stupid to ask an expert. I do it all the time. When I bought my house, I hired a real estate lawyer. Could I do it? Yes, technically. I've actually done real estate closings. But it was 20 years ago when I was right out of law school and I still remember how. You know, when I bought my last house, I went and hired a real estate lawyer. If I was accused of a crime, I would hire a criminal defense lawyer like that. I wouldn't even think about trying to defend myself. And the same is true more generally for folks who aren't attorneys. You know, if you're, whatever you are, if you're a plumber, if you're a landscaper, any, it doesn't matter. You know your job. I don't. I'm going to come to you and ask you for your help. And please, do the same. Don't be afraid of us. Most of us offer free consultations or very inexpensive consultations. You know, I do. I know lots of other lawyers do. If we can't help you, we can help you find someone. We all have a list of contacts. You know, If you come to me and ask me for criminal offense, I won't do it. But I know a criminal defense lawyer who I know and I trust. I will give you her number. Come to ask me for a real estate thing. I know one. I will find it. You, know, you live in England and you need a copyright lawyer in England. I know one or I can find one. So come to us and ask, please. We won't laugh at you, at least certainly not while you're in our office, maybe when you leave. <laughs> but other than that, please come and ask us. You know, I'm online. If you need help, if you have a friend who needs help, reach out to me, please. I am happy to help. It's literally my job to help. And I enjoy that part of it very much. And that part is not horrific at all. It really is the best part of it. And I thank you very much for listening to my stories. If anybody has any questions, would like to talk to me about them, happy to do that either online or here at the con if you see me. Obviously, I like to talk, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much for coming. Silver Gatto Man, he bought me a coffee. Silver Gatto Man, here is the song for thee. He likes to video all the panels at the cons. 
You should go and watch them whether they are short or long. So I got your man, you video that's not a jibe. All of you go to his YouTube channel and like and subscribe.